Hi, everyone. I'm Emily. And I'm Vince. And this is The Lighthouse Lowdown. Spooky, spooky Spooky. edition. (laughs) Well, not really spooky. Not spooky? Disappointingly spooky. I don't know. Sad spooky or what's happening? What do you mean? Just I wanted it to be more haunted. For those who aren't sitting here with us, it is late October. So that's why. When this comes out, it'll be the 28th. Nice. Just before Halloween, the week of Halloween. Dope. So I tried to pick a lighthouse that was a little bit spooky. And um, it's not as spooky as I wanted it to be. Oh. Well, still considered one of the most haunted places in the U.S. I mean, that can be uh, that can be good for the people in the story if it's not as spooky as you wanted. Yeah, I suppose. I think I think what actually happened is that it is, it is very spooky. It's very haunted, but the evidence is lacking, oh. and I'm a little skeptical about some of it. No one's made a documentary about this. There have been a couple episodes, two episodes of Ghost Hunters on the subject, and they did they. Had, Experience some things, but the the problem is whenever haunted places go too far into details about who these people are, mm-hmm. it's like you don't know really. I mean, if you give them first and last names, like you're telling me, I don't know, just how do you know for sure? Like a reading said yes when you said, "Is this this man?" Like how well, do you think they really know? What we talked their what their earthly names used to be. I actually can't remember who it was. It's been a while now, but we talked to someone who does paranormal investigation yeah. here on the podcast. Was that about a year ago? Was that last October? <gasps> yeah. That what? was, yeah, for Marquette Harbor Lighthouse. That's right. That's right. We talked to Marquette Harbor, and, and I think they were talking about individuals they know who died there on the grounds, and so they were suspect that that was the ghost. Yeah. So, first and last name in those cases. Is that what yeah. you're saying? Well, one of the instances that I was talking about, he didn't die there. Oh, so it's well. like, I don't know. I just, I don't know. They were super paranormal, by the way. That's right. I follow them on Facebook, so I get a lot of notifications. I think I actually do as well. Oh, I'm just, nice. I'm not on you're there just, a lot. Yeah. You're not a big social media fan. Okay. So I'm going to go into a history buoy. I am on a roll of history buoys. Woo! We love it. And I'm going to talk about Winslow Lewis because I mentioned him, and I, I'm pretty sure it was on our last episode, I uh, said something negative about him. And I was yes. like, man, I really hope I'm right about He's that. the potential murderer suspect. No. Nope, uh, never mind. <laughs> Vince just checks out while I'm talking. No, I'm just kidding. Um, he's the guy who built lighthouses and had no experience in building lighthouses. <sighs> yeah. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I was right. And in the lighthouse community, he is not talked about very nicely oh. or well liked. Poor Winslow. I'll go. Well, no. He earned it. (laughs) Okay, so I'll go into details. So a lot of this information I'm going to tell you is based off of an article in the Keeper's Log by the USLHS. So this was posted in like their magazine. Good reading. Good reading. So Winslow Lewis was born May 1770. So we were going way back. Lewis was a sea captain living in Wellfleet, Massachusetts. Yep, we've been there. Died there as well. So really bookended his life there. He put forth his design for a quote unquote new lamp for the lighthouse service at that time, lighthouse establishment, U.S. lighthouse establishment. About what year? 1810, he patented it. So let me pull up a picture. I have the picture from the actual patent, which was burned. (laughs) So this is believed to be the photo that was included in the patent. Wow. So on the left... For those that are viewing it on YouTube, we have a a good YouTube following now. For those on YouTube, um, the left is what was considered to be in the patent. And the right is like an up-close version of where you see DCB, that whole area. Yeah. Up-close. A little detail. I like it. Found that online, you know. Looks like a clothes rack version of a lantern. So, here's what it is. This is the design for an Argon lamp. Okay. A type of fuel. Right? Argand is a the last name of the guy who invented the Argand lamp, oh. which was revolutionary, much better than what we were using before, and used widely overseas starting in 1784. 
So long before this guy mm -hmm. came forward with this. Before but the U.S. was behind. We were still using spider lamps. And so this design oh, used half of the oil. <laughs> <laughs> I hate these. We're stealing European concepts. Is that what you're saying? Okay. So this lamp used half the oil of the spider lamps that we were using. Efficient. And had a much higher candle power. Well, what Lewis did was take the argon lamp design slap a green magnifying lens on the front of it, which actually lowered the candle power. You know, the power of the lamp design is lowered by adding color in front yeah, of it. Yeah, the wavelength. Such as yeah. green, yeah. Yep. And especially just like a surface that is between... Yeah, obtru ob yeah. obstructing, obtruding. Whatever. Obtruding. Whatever that <laughs> means. Obtusing. Obtuse angles. <laughs> but so this was far superior to what we had, but... The credit really goes to Argent, but we, we didn't have that design here, so he patented it, and he's like, oh, I'll just put a green light, green lens on there, so it's technically a new design. It's like, well, you stink. So, 1810, he comes out with this patent. Yes. Um, I don't know how it worked back in the day, but I assume that means he was awarded the patent, so it was reviewed and deemed... By Congress, yeah. So, Congress deemed... I, again, I don't know if this has always been the rule, but there's something about patents where it has to be unique, mm -hmm. and it's it can't be repeatable, um, like on accident. Like, oh, I, I accidentally made this process or this this product. Yeah. So his argon lamp knockoff. Exactly. With a green tint. Uh huh. What did he say the green tint was for? Is that legible in this document, or uh, did you look into I that? I never. No, I never saw it. I I believe. I mean. It's clear to me that he added the green to differentiate it for an argon lamp, mm. which would automatically mean that his patent has no value. Interesting. But um, so this lamp obviously had lots of problems because he didn't have the design for the argon lamp. So he used a copper plate on the parabolic reflector part mm -hmm. that had a silver coating on it. And one, the copper would easily warp under the heat of its own candle. Yeah. So that's already problematic. The silver coating was scratched really easily. Like just cleaning it with like a cloth could scratch right. it. So it's just worthless. Dang. I'm, I'm being really hateful on here, but it, it's all fact. Was the argon lamp at the time, was it like a silver alloy? I Something don't know. Something that was more durable, probably. Curious. I mean, I I can't. I have no idea what was going on in 1800 yeah, as far no. as material science goes. Right. That's funny though. And then another thing is soot built up really easily on this green lens they had going on. Regardless, Congress purchased the patent for a very large sum, and awarded Lewis the like contract to put one of these lamps in every single lighthouse that existed in the U.S. at that time. So this guy was making bank. Government projects. I know. Uh, I'm pretty sure the article said something like, and thus began Lewis dipping his hand into the government pockets or something like that. Was it? It's like, ooh, brutal. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Did this turn into like a family fortune over time? Um, I don't know. The only was family it? member that I heard about, in especially in this article, but like other ones as well, was IWP Lewis, who was his nephew, and he was his arch nemesis. Oh. So I'll talk about that briefly in a, in a second. This contracting and like, you know, uh, th this award patent and everything kind of plunged him into the world of navigational aids where there wasn't a lot of experience going on. And yeah. so he just kind of started winning bids to build lighthouses. And there was a bunch of stuff in between too. Like he was awarded being the only supplier of the oil that they used in the lighthouses. Sounds fishy. Yeah. Sounds like what? he was giving some kickback to some early right. corrupt and, and what does that even mean? Uh, do you don't make oil, so what do you mean? Yeah, the sole source. Yeah. Supplier, yep. Very strange. Don't even know how that happened. But eventually in there, he started tr winning bids for lighthouses because he was always the low bid because he had no idea. I mean, like, because I'm, I'm sure he was doing it as cheaply as possible, and they're like, oh, excellent. <laughs> Make this lighthouse for four thousand dollars. It's like, like well, your, your name's on that patent, so you must be the lighthouse man. Yeah, you've got all the knowledge. So Lewis won these bids and built a lot of lighthouses in the U.S. Uh, I saw over eighty, and maybe I don't. I mean, I don't really know the exact number, but over eighty at the time. That's nuts. But these lighthouses were super short lived because they were beat built cheaply, and he had zero engineering background, and he was just like in charge of 
lighthouse designs. It just blows my mind. Like today, you could not build anything without having like an engineering certification yeah, or you something. Get certified, get sealed, all that. Yeah. yeah. So only a couple of his lighthouses survived today. Like literally a couple. And he built um, 90 somewhere? Uh, over 80. He had five standard designs for lighthouses ranging from 25 to 65 feet tall. So like he would select one depending on how tall he'd want the lighthouse to be. But they were like Smart. cookie cutter. Well, it's yeah. not smart because the point of lighthouses is that they all look extremely different from each oh, other or yeah. mostly. Uh, I'm going to pull up a picture. That's so funny. The day Were the day marks diversified enough though? Look at this. Oh, not really. <laughs> always white, always black top, like rounded. You can see there's some design differences. I got I got pictures pulled up. We got um, the first lighthouse at Robbins Reef. We have Chatham Lighthouse. Oh, yeah, we know Chatham. And uh, the one in the middle, I think it's called Cape Elizabeth Lighthouse. Oh, I like that. All of these no longer standing, I, I am pretty sure. So, Yeah, that makes sense. But you can tell his designs are all originating from the exact same thing, just scaled up into different heights. I mean, there's there's some practicality yeah, to that. Yeah, there's some, there's some intelligence in doing that. But for lighthouses, you can't really just scale things up to make no, it. No, but there's, you know, the right sales pitch. You can sell something, especially to folks. What percentage of people now or back then, like, could have an intelligent conversation on the structure of a lighthouse mm -hmm. in the utility of a lighthouse. Yeah. Like not a lot of folks. Right. And 65 is not that crazy tall. So no, you'll see in our lighthouse today, which was actually an accident that uh, Winslow Lewis built a lighthouse that was insufficient for the space because he just pulled from one of his standard designs and it didn't work. That son of a bitch. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, you know Stephen Pleasanton? We've talked about him before. I don't know the name. He's the He was the fifth auditor of the treasury and was close with Lewis and placed a lot of confidence in, in him because Stephen Pleasanton had nothing, had no idea, anything. What? He's a fraud. <laughs> so many words escaping me. He had no experience in lighthouses as well and was supposed to be in charge of stuff like that. Like the treasury was in charge uh, before the lighthouse board was formed. Right, right. So whatever Lewis told him, he listened. And like, pe you know, when it started coming out, people are like, this guy is a fraud. This guy is building garbage. And, you know, his lamps are useless. I can't see when I'm sailing. Um, he would always back him up. Always had his back. So That's nice. That's a nice friend. It's too bad he's incompetent. And was Lewis nice. was the one who told Stephen Pleasanton that Fresnel lenses were not that great. Far too expensive. And had a French. couple of seamen say that the U.S.'s lamps were no different. So there'd be no purpose in spending all that money to have <sighs> Fresnel lenses. Yeah, you wouldn't want the superior, yeah, you wouldn't know. It's just superior European new innovation. Yeah, we don't want to look crazy doing all that. And he listened. So that's kind of part of why we delayed getting Fresnel lenses for so long. It's because this crazy. doofus... <laughs> I wonder if he's just paying everybody. Well, the the whole reason that he would do that is because he wants to, one, keep supplying oil. Sure. Two, keep his lamps as being the ones. And because they're so poorly made and so easily damaged, he keeps getting to replace the parts and make money right. from all that. So Yeah, it's like Chevrolet building trucks. <laughs> <laughs> you want to elaborate on that? I don't I know. Could, well, I could just say Ford or Dodge, any of the American companies. People oh. always make jokes like that, like... Well, they build it to break. They don't build it to last because they're they're counting on you coming in for a new transmission. That stinks. New engine. And that's where they make their money. It's not actually true, um, but people say that as a as a knock on their neighbor's truck. Yeah. So that's funny. Anyways, thank you for the insight. Mr. Pleasanton was in office from 1820 to 1852, so we had 32 solid years of not informed decision-making on American lighthouses. That's a very precise I'll way to say, say that. It. So 1852 is when the lighthouse board took over. So all of that. So Lewis, ah. Lewis. So we already know that he's capable of stealing a patent design, subtly changing it a little bit to be his own. He dipped so low. Let me tell you. So he stole, stole a patent idea from his friend, David Melville, and this is all recorded. He had evidence and everything. It was just stolen. 
He was an inventor of the time and came up with an idea to keep oil warm in the winter so it didn't like get thick and, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, make it harder for the light. Like often the candles would go out because the oil's too cold. So they like had ideas to put stoves in the lantern room yeah. to like try and keep it warmer, but it just didn't work very well. So David had an idea and was having dinner with Lewis and two other people. So there were witnesses to this. Lewis was like, I don't think I understand your idea. I don't get it. So David drew a picture of his idea, explained it in detail, and then told him that he was testing it and already knew that it worked. Mm -hmm. Lewis was like, oh, this is a great idea. Um, I'll go pitch it in Washington and let you know what happens. So I think it was almost two years go by and Melville's like, I haven't heard anything from you. Have you pitched it to him? Like, yeah. did they say anything? And Lewis responded with this letter that basically was like, I have zero recollection of that ever happening. And I think some people have already patented uh, this idea. And Melville did some digging and found out that the person who patented this idea was Lewis. And he was just like, oh, there was, there's a guy named Jackson and a guy named Black who both have patented something similar. And he looks and... It was just Lewis. <laughs> In the public record. He's lying to his buddy. Yeah. So then Melville had this huge legal battle because he's like, you <sighs> can't, pat like, he, you know yeah. that you're making bank off of this idea because it's really important. It's like a great thing. And Lewis was like demeaning him in, in letters and stuff. Like, oh, I have never heard such language from my friend. And like, just being like gaslighting him. Yeah. basically, Like a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like they do and kept like dodging his letters and stuff. And so then Melville would have pe people deliver letters in person so that he knows that Lewis got the letter. I'm like, served. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so intense. So in the end, Lewis's patent was null, but there wasn't really much that came out of that. It's not like I didn't read that. Like Melville was really wealthy and that he, he patented yeah. the idea and everything. But so as Melville was, his nephew or am I crossing? No, those? no. N Melville was just his friend. His friend. And yeah. did what was Melville's uh, invention? Did, did we I don't discuss know. it? Okay. It was Maybe just, I'll do that as a future. Yeah, that's uh, a good idea. Because I like talking about those patents anyways. Yeah, that would be cool to track like the years that it was patented and everything. Yeah. So that's really interesting. Yeah. just goes to show his character in the end, I think, that you would... Steal an idea like that, pretend what a story. that you didn't, and then I know, and it's just and listen, there's probably a bunch of other great things that he did, but I'm just basing off of US LHS fact. History's tough, man. Yeah. I mean, if what if that's not true? Just supposed. What if none of that was true? Yeah. And, and some like you just you're just slandered and the whole community <laughs> the, you know, two hundred years later yeah. is talking about you as a fraud and a and a thief. And I I'm not saying that to defend him. I'm mm. just, what's written down between a number of parties is eventually agreed upon as truth. Yeah. Especially, I mean, now I would say more things are provable than back then. Right. But back then, even if you had a dinner with other people there, mm -hmm. that's like admissible in court. Yeah. You know, and I guess I it still would be, right? Yeah. And in that but, court, those guys came in and testified like crazy. we were there. This is the picture he had in the patent is the one that this guy drew. We had pork chops. He served red <laughs> wine. I was a little drunk, but not too drunk to remember. Here's my handwritten letter for the invite to prove that I was. <laughs> <laughs> it does blow my mind that the only way to court. It's so funny because we're just living, living in modern day life talking about this. But that there was the only way to correspond with people was written letters. Mm -hmm. like you just had to send a letter and be like stewing until they respond or like oh, i hope they got that you never actually know now we just send a text message yeah. it's there in less than a second you're I, i'm not going to take the time to look up what it is so you're going to judge me i don't remember oh. the author nor the book okay okay <laughs> but i listened to an audiobook recommended by one of our listeners and an oh, old friend of mine nice um now it's been two years, so that's my excuse. Oh, that's right. I remember but this. It was it was on one of the gentlemen who was credited. It was so it was a, a biography. Mm -hmm. One of the gentlemen who was credited for a lot of geology discovery. So talking about rock formations and how oh. to find oil and minerals and how to drill in like the early days uh, in England, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the whole story is based on uh, it's telling telling the story of this gentleman from age. 
20 to 70 something when he was really active in that community and brilliant person, um, lots of interesting discoveries, several interesting patents. And, you know, he would go see his wealthy friend and see a rock that they had collected that was on their shelf and a collection of rocks eventually grew in his house. And it was renowned that people would come and talk in the community about his work in geology and his collection of rock and, you know, different layers and yeah. his description of how uh, there are layers of earth over time, uh-huh. clearly defined. And you can follow a vein of gold and you can follow a vein to oil or coal or these resources. And it was so massively important for the time. The point of this and why it's relevant, I'm thinking the timeline for one, older, but even so. Yeah. And two, like gentlemen get together to discuss their rocks. Yeah. But, it, but really <laughs> it was groundbreaking it was like what if we could discover all the gold yeah what if we could be the most powerful men ever as far as wealth goes Mm -hmm. because of this dude wandered around the hills and was brilliant and thought about what if the earth is like cake (laughs) it's like cake (laughs) so uh, that's massively simplified but it is it is interesting to me so much of history and and, uh, i don't know the age of this photo on screen now but we're looking american lighthouse foundation supplied photo of uh, Elizabeth? Cape, Cape Elizabeth, Cape Elizabeth, I think. and just like now, today, that could be AI, that could be a sketch, oh, true. that could be you know, we're, the authenticity is going to go away. But throughout history, paper was everything. A mm-hmm. photo was, yeah, totally admissible. Now photos are not not at all admissible. The yeah. videos were for a while, not anymore. For example, like I was just saying, the patent burned because there was some fire at. You know, in some government building where they lost a bunch of historical. Oh, really? What? What is this? uh, No, I don't know. I'm just saying like the image was supposedly the image. You know, the Library of Alexandria. We'll never know what was there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it it burns and you got nothing. And they were like, oh, we think that this was uh, uh, the picture that was in the patent. It's like, you'll never really know. It's so crazy. Now we've got everything is permanent well until it's not if if i'm getting carried away i know oh here we go you know the whole uh doomsday preppers folks talk about various scenarios where electronics become unusable we have almost nothing like on paper Mm -hmm. that we can go reference uh as individuals i mean even if the world didn't end uh, it'd be really interesting if a bunch of us just lost some of our electronics just boop set us back because that's our mm-hmm. modern day tool uh, well even think about it you wouldn't have pumps pushing water into your pipes what would you do what yeah. do you do correct oh well thank you for the um little sidetrack there a history buoy within a history buoy yeah, the coffee really gets me <laughs> sidetracking i'm sorry about that everyone <laughs> no i like it it's good that's that's where it's this is where it happens this is the podcast where it all, it all happens good luck skipping that history buoy <laughs> 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 that was so funny uh Check out our YouTube comments for anyone who wants to understand. We love getting comments from people. So much fun. True. Uh, and another note is that we need to start covering lighthouses that people are asking us to cover. And we've done a couple, but I, I think I'm going to make a, a little mini series of people. Listener who have, requests. Yes. Nice. And there, there's, some, I mean, they're all. Oh awesome. yeah, they're all interesting. Yeah, yeah. So there's no reason not to. So I'm, I'm going to. That's great. And it's about to be your episode next. I'm going to get a little break and then I'm going to be doing listener lighthouses. Okay, moving on. So earlier we were talking about David Melville, which is his friend. His nephew, who is who you were thinking of, Mm -hmm. is IWP Lewis. And he was a civil engineer and a lighthouse expert who was just against Winslow Lewis in that he had experience in the area, saw that his stuff was garbage and probably knew enough about his character to be like... Okay, I feel bad. I'm trashing all over it. But like this, this these are things that are documented. But this is what you found. Okay. Right? You're reporting on what you found. We don't know these I people. I hate just being like, I don't know them. I don't know him. So uh, I'm just going by, you know, word of mouth. We'll, which is We'll kind try of, to be responsible with the information we yeah. have. If there was an article that said a bunch of nice things about him and that was it, then I would also use that. But there isn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So his nephew was against him. He reported that the lighthouses of the U.S. in 1843 were, quote, all more or less defective and all crying out for continual repairs, end quote. Ouch. So he was definitely advocating against 
his, uh, his uncle there. The National Archives mentions Winslow Lewis as, quote, able to thrive in this era lacking in wholesome regulation. <laughs> Damn. So just like taking advantage of things and like, in the end, he was an incredible businessman in that he made millions of today's dollars in yeah. contracts and just like, this is people. what's going to make me the most money. And so that's what I'm going to do. So you can commend him for having business skills, but play the game as people who love lighthouses. I think it's a great disservice. And that's all I have to say about that. Haters going to hate. He passed away in 1850. So shortly after that lighthouse board took over, clean shit up. <laughs> 1850, passed away, patented in 1810, born in 1770. Excellent memory. Good date recollection. So, like 80, so he lived a full life. Yeah. He wasn't murdered. No. <laughs> Unlike Spooky. some people possibly in this episode. <laughs> Again with the arm movements. Okay, let's get into our lighthouse of the day. That was a really long history, boy. Oh, yeah, wow, that was a long time. Okay, wow. <laughs> I'm so sorry, everybody. This is a long one. So we are heading to Pensacola, Florida. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I knew you were going to jump right on that, and you'll probably have some things to say about what I'm talking about. Pensacola was the oldest European settlement in mainland America in... 1559, even though it was a failure, so it was abandoned for a while longer after that, because there was immediate hurricane and just wiped out, like, a bunch of people. It was crazy. Florida. Hurricane massacre. Florida's been Floridaing for a long time. Yeah. Pull up a little mappy map here. For those that don't know, Pensacola is almost not Florida. It's all... What's next to that? Gulf Shores is off to the west, and Destin is off to the... <laughs> The west, the left, which <laughs> is west, and the right on map is uh, east. What what is the is this uh, Louisiana next to it? Georgia? Oh my gosh! Um, uh, honestly, we need we seriously need to get our geography together. I'm from Kansas. We we don't know. We're in the middle. That's all we know. One moment. I used to live in Texas, so at least I had yeah. some kind of some relation, some closeness to this. I drove through this. These states. <laughs> okay. So to be fair, Florida, the panhandle, I think they say, goes out west, right? Above it is Georgia. Okay. But uh, Alabama is to the west. Are you certain? Because that, that this, this. So Gulf Shores look is at in the, Alabama. Look at the state line. I don't see another one branching off that. It's all one state. No, no, I'm saying Alabama shares the coast. Oh, but okay. Georgia's just north. So. Kinston, Samson, Geneva, those are all Georgia. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. All right, well, excellent. Wait. <laughs> I think it's all Louisiana. Let me see. Alabama. Let me see. Montgomery. Can I have some? Yeah, that's all Alabama. Roof. Roof. <laughs> We got to edit that. I can't look that stupid. No, we are we ringtone. are just who we are. Okay, you're right. Oh, yeah. Louisiana is not even close. I don't know. I, I don't apologize. Know. Everybody to knows. The south. This is what it means to be human. We're just being as real as you can possibly be. I'm leaving it in. <laughs> Give me our true selves. Um. Anyway, so the U.S. took control... <clears throat> of Florida from Spain in 1821, which for some reason sounds really soon. 1821. Wait, hold on. Lewis patented on. his idea 11 years before that. What did you just say? The U.S. took control, US took of, Florida control of Florida via Florida Spain? From Spain. They took it from Spain. Oh, okay. In a treaty. Gosh. 1821. English is hard. Yeah, Florida has the first settlement ever in... Uh, ah. Really? I think we talked about this over near... Uh, I don't know. On the, on the East Coast. <laughs> the oldest city in the United States is what I'm thinking of. Oh, St. Augustine? St. Augustine, yeah. Did we talk about that? I think there's been many lighthouses there, and the originals were Spanish. Oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Spanish, yeah. When we did that, we appropriated $6,000 two years after for a lighthouse. So we quickly started moving in and making changes and placed it so that ships entering... The harbor, Pensacola Bay, is that what that is? I think so. Okay. 
but they placed it so that the ships entering the bay could aim directly for the lighthouse and make it easier ah, on everybody. Nice. So that was good. The Aurora Borealis lightship was placed here while the light was being built, which I think is cool because we've talked about the Aurora Bor- Borealis. It's called something else now, I think. Yeah. But the lighthouse was built by none other than our wonderful Winslow Lewis for a low bid of $4,927, selected by Stephen Pleasanton. <laughs> crazy <laughs> no, it's just so funny that it's like i'll select the low bl- bid of my friend uh, winslow lewis you stinkers what is all this corruption yep Vince, you're just like staring the at me the land of opportunity yeah exactly so this lighthouse was completed 1824 using his 40 foot design cookie cutter design kind of small With a flashing white light that was on for seven seconds and dark for 63 seconds. So very long, dark period, which actually continued this like long, dark period after a flash for a while. It's a one in 10 ratio. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Pulled up picture. Looks familiar. Is it a wind vane on top? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, or a flag. It almost looks like it's fake. So I'm not totally certain on that. AI. (laughs) They just needed to add a little oomph. So they colored in a tiny <laughs> flag. I don't know. You can tell that that's a Short. Winslow Lewis design. Yeah, looks um, like him. Didn't stay for very long. Well, didn't d- it wasn't. Well, the water's right there. Right? Am, uh, I be, am I looking at the water? That looks like, yeah, maybe. Anyways. At this same time, the U.S. also started construction, 1826, on the Pensacola Navy Yard. Today, this is where the Naval Air Station Pensacola is. And the lighthouse is within these grounds. So if you want to visit the lighthouse, it has to be within the Navy's opening, open times. Can't just like walk in. No, you can't just be like on the grounds at any time. The Navy Yard dealt with suppression of slave trade and piracy in its early years. And then in the Civil War, most of it was reduced to rubble by the Confederates and was rebuilt following the war. And in World War I, Pensacola had the only naval air station which rapidly expanded over time. Today is the home of... The Blue Angels and our beautiful Pensacola Lighthouse. Hell yes. Go America. There's a s- wicked photo that I'm going to show at the end of the lighthouse with the Blue Angels in it. It's oh, amazing. Cool. There's a lot of super cool pictures online, so everyone should check it out. So our first keeper, Jeremiah Ingram, married and had three children in the lighthouse and died in 1840. His wife, Michaela, took over as keeper officially until she passed in 1855. And this lighthouse actually has a lot of history of women keepers. I think she might have been the only head keeper, um, especially for 15 years. That's insane and actually official. But there was also a lot of second assistant keepers who were women who took over for like their husbands if they passed away. So That's so nuts. Taking names and kicking butt. Hauling oil. Yeah. (laughs) They'd have to have muscles. Oh, yeah. They weren't messing around. Yeah. By 1850, complaints were rampant about the lighthouse being far too dim and short, often covered by trees from view. Why didn't you just build it taller? Why? Low bid. <sighs> I asked so that question dumb. on all the construction projects. Why are we <laughs> taking low bid offers? <laughs> Why are we allowing this to happen? So 1852, the lighthouse board, brand new, called for a new quote, first class seacoast light, end quote, which is something I've said in our past couple episodes. First class. Yeah, that someone just takes control and is like, we need a first class seacoast light. We can't have this second class shit. Yeah, yeah, none of those garbage, Lewis garbage. As I said in our last episode, when they say first class seacoast light, it means it's tall, sexy. Oh, yeah, I'm getting excited. (laughs) (laughs) 1854 so two years later congress allocated $25,000 for a new one as well as $30,000 two years later to aid in the completing the construction it's always so much more expensive government work yep and the 151 foot white tower was lit with a first order for Nellens on January 1st 1859 January 1st it's cute I've seen a couple instances of that terrible time of year to light a lighthouse but I guess hey you're in Florida, so. Yeah, true. The um, seasons hit not so hard. It's not like a Massachusetts lighthouse. Oh, gosh, or like Maine. Oh, it would be impossible. But this Fresnel lens had a four-second white flash every 56 seconds, so still a really long 
period between flashes and was built half a mile west of the original lighthouse. Kay. And I don't know what happened to the lighthouse after that. I assume demoed, but I don't have info. Who knows? Hold up a picture. That's Beautiful. so cool. So pretty. Such an old photo. Almost looks like an art piece, like a yeah. sketch or drawing. It said it said online that this photo was actually taken the year that it was completed. So 1850s, this picture was taken. Is like that, that had to have been the second that cameras started becoming a thing, right? Uh, I honestly, I don't know. I've said this before. Yeah, I think early 1800s, we had some cameras going on. Okay. Um, I've seen some really cool antique photography lately. Mm -hmm. So is that an integral lighthouse? No, that's like, um, if you think about... Oh, uh, gosh. What is it like? Um, Force perspective? No, no. It's connected, but it's just the little entrance. Uh, it's two stories tall. What are you talking about? Oh, no. I, th I think those are just like windows letting in. You c I mean, you could be right, but it's not the keeper's house. Okay. It's just like, what is the lighthouse I'm trying to think of? Man, uh, there's so a bunch of them. Tell me more about it. Uh, I'm thinking of Curatuck and... Kiritak is, is the big uh, brick tower yeah. on the Outer Banks. And the yeah. other one we saw, I keep thinking bald head. It's not. It's um, on the Outer Body Banks? Island. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. There's an entrance mm -hmm. and it's protruded. This one is appears to be two stories tall, which I think is unique. Yeah, possibly. But in any case, I was thinking that was a like keeper's house. And I was like, wow, that's... Oh. that's <laughs> <laughs> they're like Integral to the <laughs> extreme. You're on the real estate listing. It's like there's a lighthouse built into this. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, it's 95% of the structure. <laughs> 151 feet tall. Bedroom has great views. So great. Oh my gosh. I would love to have a bedroom at the top of a lighthouse. I mean, only if there's an elevator. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sorry for the distractions there. So, after the Civil War broke out, the Union gained control of the Pensacola Lighthouse from the Confederates in 1862. Okay. Fitted it with a fourth order lens until the first order lens was rediscovered in 1869 and returned to the lantern room. So for a while there, it officially had a fourth order lens and then they found the first order and uh, put it back in there. I wonder where it was. I feel like a lot of squirreling away happened. It's hard to hide a first during, order lens. During wars anyway. Actually, I, don't feel, I feel like it wouldn't because you can take it apart and it's just probably yeah, fits pretty snug in, some, in like a crate. Following wars, things take a long time to resurface. I don't know if it's like people are keeping crates of things in warehouses and they're like, oh, we have to sort through all this. I'm telling you, I have a suspect. I, have I a suspect, suspect <laughs> that there are private collections oh. out there. A lot of them. Not There's got to be. A lot of them of Fresnel lenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, I other say memorabilia. Wrong. And other memorabilia. I'm sorry for another sidetrack. It's fine. We talked, just you and I talked recently about um, the lighthouse down um, near Galveston Island. Bolivar? Bolivar Point. Bolivar Point? Yeah. Um, so I looked it up. They're doing a restoration right now. Oh, excellent. The li that's the reason that the lantern light room is lantern gone. room is entirely removed. However, they're not going to put the lantern room back on. Oh. They're having a new lantern room built. Okay. The existing is to be preserved and put indoors and be Ooh. the... The main visitation focal point. So they're like $5 million into this thing, phase one. Oh, my. Um, into the restoration. Well, it's spectacular, okay? As long as they put a new one up top. No, I know. It, yeah, as long as there's a new one that's going to function the same, that's going to look the same, and be really stable. And we still get access to the original that we get to see, open to everybody. I am so excited yeah. about that. But how the point is, yes. Sorry. The point is... <laughs> What if one of those lantern rooms just disappeared? They're yeah. like, oh, yeah, we put a new one. That no one asked the question, what happened to the original one that was yeah. up there through Especially all this history? Especially back then when it wasn't history. It was just like, modern oh, day. It's in someone's living room yeah. somewhere. Like Somebody bought it. It's a cool thing. Like this guy has a velociraptor skeleton. This guy has a lantern room. I'm sure they had like auctions where they're like crates of miscellaneous Crazy. things from pre-World War stuff. And yeah. you just are like, I'll pay you $10 for one million. of those. And you open it and you're like, what is this? Glass? <laughs> so, Prisms? Big side you have no again. idea what you have in your hands. Yeah. I, just, I think there I think there are collectors out there. Just like there are private lighthouses. They're on mm -hmm. private land and they're just, people bought it because they wanted yeah, it. Yeah. Like most of the, or a lot of the um, 
light ships are just like private places. Crazy. All through time. That same year, 1869, a new symmetrical duplex dwelling was built and um, because they added new assistant keepers, I believe. Mm. And so they needed a place for them and their families to live. So they built a duplex and the day mark was changed. So while the bottom third stayed white so that you could differentiate it from the trees, the top two thirds was black to differentiate it from the sky. Interesting. And that's actually the day mark that we have today. Cool. It is that's pretty unique. nice. You can see a nice picture of the duplex keeper's cottage right there. And that's in front of the tower. Yeah. Okay. It, I'm Not connected. My brain is like, <laughs> look how big it looks. Your at eyeballs it. are like, Arr. I want to see it that way. Really neat though. Yeah. What a cool day mark in great cool. shape too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's being very well taken care of. This is one of those places that has a website that you would be very happy about. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. St. Augustine level. Let's go. I won't click through it, but. It'll be, it's linked in our show notes. So if anyone wants to go check out their website, they have a really, really good one. Between 1863 and 1886, there were 11 different keepers at the station, nine of whom were fired for offenses ranging from neglect to intoxication. <laughs> so just a bad run of keepers at Florida this White man. House. <laughs> People trying to escape life. After this, George T. Clifford was hired and served for 31 years. Clifford. So he... Broke the uh, the bad string of keepers. 31 years is a long time. It's crazy. And Clifford's a cool name. It so is cool. Good for him. You think it used to be more common? I feel like Clifford Probably. used to be more common. Clifford the big red dog, I don't think. I think it's awesome. Maybe they killed it. I don't I don't think it. people wanted to name their children after the dog. The dog. <laughs> I don't know. We learned that actually when I was at a but Lighthouse um, oh. exhibit. What? Uh, Without me? No, you were there. Gay Head Light, uh, the Lantern Room. Oh, yes. Was there. And there's an exhibit on Clifford the Big Red Dog. Oh, yeah. The person, I can't name because I don't recall, who was the author, originator of Clifford, was from Martha's Vineyard. Oh, we I were, didn't know that. We were in the Martha's Vineyard uh, Museum, which is really neat. You must have done a little reading while you I were did. there. Yeah. They had a okay. whole exhibit on Clifford. I was like, <laughs> why? What? That's well, nothing to do with anything. Because he was from sure does. Martha's Vineyard. Anyways. Very cool. So we're still in the 1800s, which is wild. 1874 and 1875, the lighthouse was hit by lightning, melting metal ap- apparatus inside of it, yeah. which made it clear that the lightning rod, which you've talked about in a past history buoy, That's right. was faulty, found to be defective, and replaced. So we just had a couple instances. And after that, the lighthouse was also hit by an earthquake, 1886. Hmm. Before which the light was found to have cracks in it. And Uh-oh. they said this was likely from past hurricanes and damage it took during the Civil War because it was across from a fort or there were two warring forts oh. facing each other. I can't. I didn't well, look. All the bays down there, it's probably a really important. Yeah. Um, even to today, it's still right. an important area, strategic area. But uh, something else they mentioned on Bolivar, Bolivar, B. Oliver was uh, that it had survived multiple hurricanes mm-hmm. as well. And yeah. well, earthquakes is what they, they referenced, but oh. as part of the repara- re- reparations, Re- repairs. Re- <laughs> Gosh, I'll shut up. No. You get it. There's been yeah. earthquakes. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I, I, they have some pictures. I didn't put it on our slides that this lighthouse was actually hit by like direct hits from artillery fire. And oh like left man. little craters in this outside of the lighthouse, but it didn't penetrate to the inner layer, so it was just kind of like patched up, I think. And People so then that shooting at lighthouses. I know, how rude! I know. That Leave them alone. That might have been in Florida too. Got the kid with the rifle. I think that was Saint Augustine. Might have been. Stinkers. So at this point, it was repointed, which is a term I had never heard before, which is fixing the mortar in between bricks. Hmm. repointed and repainted in 1913 we're jumping ahead the u.s navy established the u.s's first aeronautical station at the navy yard very cool in pensacola training over a thousand pilots for world war one and thousands wow. more in world war ii cool. this is where we have the super cool picture i wonder if my grandpa went to pensacola ever that's really neat there's a couple of other really cool ones but this is where they practice so actually now you can take tours through the lighthouse um, 
to watch the, them practice. The Blue from. Angels are housed there. That's where their base is at. Yeah. It used really to be neat. somewhere else, and then they moved here. I think I made a note. Uh, let's see. That's a cool photo. Uh, no, I guess I didn't make a note. If any of you oh, don't well. know, my description of what the Blue Angels group is, it's uh, Navy. They're specially selected pilots that train very rigorously to do precision aero space maneuvers. So they're, they're in, uh, I think, F-16 jets, but they're... Very good. They they do crazy formations and practices, and they're kind of a a public outreach group uh, mm-hmm. uh, representing the Navy. Uh, it's not the Air Force. The Navy flying program. I don't. I feel like Navy pilots are supposed to be very good. Yeah, uh, so. like um, Air Force also has a group like that called the Thunderbirds. I Ooh, believe. cool. Yeah, it's kind of a rivalry thing. I think that oh, Navy I like gets that. Them, gets them uh, fired up. One over a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> But really I cool. I like that. So yeah, pretty neat. You get to go and watch them. I would definitely pay to do that. I yeah. sp- it would be crazy to get to from the top of the lighthouse too if they're like flying around it. Oh my gosh. So cool. Really cool. 1939, the Coast Guard takes over the lighthouse. Lens is electrified and the keeper's quarters gets indoor plumbing. <laughs> Spectacular. Upgrade. The road to the lighthouse, which was called Shell Road at the time. Now it's something else. Lighthouse Road, probably. Probably. <laughs> It was paved with brick and rubble from the recently demolished Fort Barrancas Barracks. Dang it. I didn't look up what happened. That's crazy. Well, you guys know what I mean. I'm sorry if I pronounced it wrong. Barracks nearby that were demolished. But I want to say that that one was a union fort. and Probably that late in the game, yeah. Yeah, and so then the other one is the one that shot the lighthouse. I mean, (laughs) yeah. 1965, the lighthouse was automated, and the Navy rented out the keeper's quarters until the building was condemned. So they rented it out hmm. and didn't do any renovations or, like, didn't keep up with it until it was so bad that it was condemned. Awful. They were accepting bids to demo the entire station, but instead the Gulf Islands National Seashore was established in order to protect it. And so the lighthouse and the dwelling were renovated extensively back to livable conditions. 1996, the Coast Guard Auxiliary starts offering tours of the lighthouse, taken over by the Pensacola Lighthouse Association, which was formed in 2006, I think. Okay, great. So the east side, so what they did was the east side of the duplex was renovated to display like an 1880s version of what it what it used to look like. Mm-hmm. So you could walk through and just see what half of the keeper's cottage used to look like. And then the west side has it exhibits on the Civil War Navy Yard and the lighthouse. So you could walk through and look at everything. The 90s and 2000s is really a good time for yeah. a lot of lighthouse They were really restorations. taking care of business. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. And I assume it's similar today? Yes, it's exactly the same. It's so if you go... the same group. Yeah. Nice. 2014, the original... <laughs> this is like this weird little side point, but 2014, the original lens pedestal of the lighthouse is discovered in the woods outside the gift shop. <laughs> what? <laughs> Some kids wandering around. Like, what's this big piece of metal? One were like, what are you telling me? It looks like it would hold a lantern. The pedestal has been out there for it's gotta be decades. It was just sitting out there, nobody noticed it in the woods. I have woods. no idea. Blind. Just you guys blind? <laughs> 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 it must have just been covered by stuff, but I don't know. I just thought that was so funny. It's just it's in the timeline. Twenty fourteen? Mm-hmm. That's pretty crazy. It's in the timeline. That uh, pen of Pensacola Lighthouse on their website. Yeah. It's like they discovered the pedestal. And I don't know what was happened to it after that. Did they, they yeah. Did they collect it? Did they go, wow, that's cool. I really hope they preserved it or something. Four years later, a $2.5 million renovation was completed, totally restoring the lighthouse and the First Order lens. Let's go. Which, by the way, is still in use in the Lantern Room. Really? Active ga- Guide to Navigation. From 1850s. Wow. Which they, you know, they rediscovered it during the war and put yeah. it back up there, but wild. There's not, there's not many going. We no. talked about uh, Hawaii has one. Mm-hmm. This is one. They they just put up Montauk Point again. Right. But I don't know if that's the original yeah, or. Yeah. See, it's very special. Especially first order. Yeah. Uh, special. If you climb, you can go up there and just see it. You can uh. probably hear the motor. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nosset lights was really loud. I enjoyed that. Powerful. Yeah, and that was I assume that's a lighter duty motor yeah. Nosset light. Because that's not that wasn't a Fresnelens. That's right. modern beacon. Relatively. So anyway, very cool. The lighthouse is located on the Naval Air Station, Pensacola. So you can visit only while it's open from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. It's nine dollars and fifty cents for tours. And um the first order lens is still up there. You can see very quick flash every 20 seconds. So it's gotten a little faster than in the past. They have a really nice picture of the inside of the lens. And that's the symbol for the Pensacola Lighthouse. Maritime Another Museum. very cool symbol. Yes. Love it. So nautical. It's on the property for the Air Force Base. Yeah. Well, excuse me, the Navy Base. Right. I find that strange that they they keep holding on. They're like, we can't allow civilians to like ruin this thing so yeah, close maybe it's to a the good base thing. so like it's ours <laughs> yeah. i think it's a good thing keep it Look protected it's a crazy image the inside of the fresnel lens those panels so are pretty huge. the rainbows everywhere really gorgeous maybe someday we'll go and check it out that logo is pretty cool i know i knew you would like that mm-hmm. they have a couple of different exhibits like i mentioned and you can book all kinds of different tours like they have sunset climbs the Blue Angels practice viewing and ghost tours. Ghost tours. We're going to talk about our... Da-na-na. S- several times it's been clicked today, but that's... <laughs> it's a haunted episode, so I'm going to go into some of the rumors swirling around this lighthouse that makes it haunted and spooky. Happy Halloween, everybody. Pensacola Lighthouse, considered one of the most haunted places in the U.S. By who? I don't know. <laughs> The internet. Everybody. The first one I'm going to, the first story I'm going to say is the one that I'm most skeptical about because they give her full name and I can't find this person anywhere. I have no idea. Mm. So they say there's a woman named Ellen Mueller who grew up in the lighthouse and got married there, then gave birth in one of the rooms and passed away from complications in 1911. So died during childbirth. 1911, in the room that she grew up in. In 1911 and before, by like a decade, there, the only men working in the lighthouse were George T. Clifford, Adrian Whiting, and Jefferson D. Miller, which is not Mueller. And never was there anyone working there with the last name Mueller. So she couldn't have been a child or like couldn't have been a child of one of the keepers growing up. If she grew up in the lighthouse, yeah. she'd have to be a child of one of the keepers. Unlikely that she has somebody else's last name at this time. Yeah. And then if she were to marry and that was her married name, why was she in, in her childhood home giving birth and not in her husband's home giving birth? You know, I just don't have all the details. Yeah. Could, there's something missing. Yeah. Like where did you get this name? And where did you find that she grew up in the lighthouse? Someone probably knows. Maybe her last name's actually Miller and it's just gotten messed up over time. Typo. Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't find Jefferson D. Miller's like, yeah. you know, how normally on like Ancestry you can find their children and stuff. I couldn't find anything. So that's all of that. That's why I'm skeptical is because I'm like, if you give her full name, it's got to be right. So... There's no logical way that she grows up, marries, and gives birth in the lighthouse unless there was a guy there that had the same last name. But anyway, they say her apparition is commonly seen in the bedroom where she grew up. And people will hear breathy whispers, feel cold spots, and smell roses. Hmm. So that's fun. Spooky. During these goose tour Goose tours. Goosed. <laughs> Honk. <sighs> They also recognized two boys named Thomas and Raymond said to be runaway slaves that were hanged in the basement and buried on the property. Mm. Wildness. Okay. Hanged in the basement would be extra hard, right? Why yeah. hang in Low the basement? Low ceilings. Low ceilings. <laughs> I don't know. Like, it's I terrible. Be casting doubt on all of this, but like... Just the way that it unfolds where there's no, Runaway if you're going to give me names, if you're going to give me names, it's just kind of diminishes the like spookiness of it. I'm like, mm. really? Raymond? 
Am I scared of Raymond? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, any apparition is going to make me scared. Breathy whispers? No, thank you. Two other children named Lizzie and Joey, I'm not going to be scared of those either, died from yellow fever in 1922. And guests sometimes feel the children running through their bodies mm. and hear children's laughter when it's really quiet. That's not good. I'm like, stop. <laughs> like, like actual instances where people get like the heebie-jeebies heebie jeebies and are like, oh, yeah. ah, and it's like somebody ran through their bodies. I don't want any spirit going through my body. Preferred not. Especially not children. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's bothersome. I just don't know what else to say. It's yeah. bo- it's bothersome. I, I can't really pin it. Okay, here's the one I was talking about. Samuel Lawrence was the head keeper from 1877 to 1885, so a good chunk of time. Mm-hmm. He, t- I don't think he passed away in the lighthouse because there was no reference to that. But many say they see him keeping a constant vigil in the lantern room and in the stairwell. What is it about ghosts in the, the stairwell? Stairs. I am uncomfortable with that. Keep vigil in the lantern room. That's fine. Don't be going up and down the stairs. No. I don't know. You know they don't have to. They could probably just teleport. (laughs) I don't know. There's also a rumor. This one is skeptical. Rumor swirling around. um, You know, keepers, Jeremiah and Michaela Ingram. She, there were the first, no. he was the first keeper, died, and she took over 15 yes. years before she passed away. They say that Michaela's love for the lighthouse surpassed the love for her husband. So they fought a lot because she had more duty for the lighthouse than to her husband. And it was his job. So he's probably like, what the heck is this? Yeah. And they say that his death in 1840 was under suspicious circumstances. And then she worked for another 15 years? Yeah. For the lighthouse. Oh, no. I don't How did know. he die? I I couldn't see, but they say they say, you know, in, in these like ooh spooky websites that he was stabbed with a kitchen knife. And I'm like, that would be murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would one hundred percent be labeled as a murder. Very suspect situation. It's suspicious circumstances. Knife knife. <laughs> I'm like, that there's no way that's true. I don't know. But they say that you can hear their arguments around the lighthouse and there's no one in sight. So wouldn't you like that to be what you go down in history? No, be arguing for all of time. (laughs) Arguing for the rest of time. I had to work here another 15 years. 2009, Ghost Hunters did an episode inside the lighthouse and revisited it a year ago as well. Wow. So we have a recent episode and an old episode. They experienced in the first episode strange voices, flickering lights. One man had his shoulder gripped by an invisible hand, giving him a chill that didn't leave for long after he left the lighthouse. That is bothersome. And then in the most recent episode, I watched like a, (gasps) I watched a, (sighs) um, like a short clip of like some of condensed episode basically. And they had sounds of doors closing, crunching, which is not a sound that I ever wanted to hear. Steps, voices, and all kinds of spooky stuff. All within the lighthouse? Yes, inside the lighthouse. Spooky. Which you can watch, I think it's called Discovery Plus or something. Discovery Plus, yeah. Yeah. The first episode was season five, episode 22, and this one's season 15, episode three. So if you guys are interested in going going and seeing, maybe you fifteen can, seasons. Sorry, I, mean, I can go watch it. That would be fun. Spooky. I think what happened is they stopped making episodes, and then now they're like doing they're revisiting places they did in their original yeah. show. I was gonna say, why did they go back? I don't know. You know, like oh, we got a new sensor. Well, and, yeah, and they actually camera. say that these new episodes they have like the updated, like most up to date technology for ghost hunting. So it's like pretty exciting. Cool. Yep. So it's definitely haunted. I think the specifics are blurry, and I would definitely still be spooked staying there. That's for certain. Any yeah. lighthouse painted black, spooky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of our, it's kind of, it's all black. But that's because kinda it's scary. iron. That's right. You know what? Jamie at work brought it up. I know I already said this on this episode, but she brought up 
fall over. And I was like, yeah, it's made of all these steel sheets welded together and creepy. And I was like, I think it's haunted. Oh, I think yeah. a bunch of people died there. All kinds and of... And then, yeah, looked it up. Oh, yeah. I was yeah. reminded of... <sighs> so scary. many dead around the lighthouse. It's wild. Oof. Naked bodies. Drowned. Perished. Anyone who's interested, one. go to our episode three, Bolivar. Was it Lighthouse? episode three? Mm-hmm. Maybe we should relight that light. <laughs> we should. That would be interesting. Recover. I have one more note to make and then I'm done. The research <laughs> assistant at Pensacola is on Jeopardy October 25th. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I hope they win. I know. I'm excited. I didn't um, know Jeopardy was still on TV. They pushed it back, so now he's going to be airing at 2 a.m. on Saturday, which by the time this comes out, it'll be passed, so maybe you uh, and I could just like watch it on online or something. Get the inside scoop. But we're totally rooting for Olaf. Go, Olaf. Go, Olaf. And that is the Pensacola Lighthouse. Very, very entertaining. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Great photos today, but not too many of them. Yeah, I wanted good to content. keep it low on photos, high content. Coffee was good in case anyone couldn't tell. You didn't actually go that crazy. Um, you, you for a input. Thursday evening. Okay, yeah, it's ripping. not Friday. That's right. Sorry. Oh, God, I wish it was Friday. <laughs> Some people, yeah. Dang it. Anyways. But that's all. So... Do you like? I like. Okay. Very good episode. I don't know how I'm going to follow this up. Uh, that's what I thought. I'm not even close to prepared. I got a big idea, but I don't think I can get there. Oh. I think I got to go small. Yeah, you have like a week or so. So. Yeah. Yeah, sorry to put the bar so high. <laughs> <laughs> Very good work. Everybody, we hope you enjoyed our episode. Keep the comments coming on YouTube. Keep the voicemails coming. Keep the emails coming. We see them all. Even if you don't hear from us, your lighthouses go into our list and I will be covering them coming up. So if you've given me a lighthouse, I will be covering it. It's happening. It's on the list. We have a spreadsheet and um, we really love hearing from everybody. So keep sending us stuff. We see it all and we love it. Um, Check us out on Instagram at the lighthouse lowdown. Send us an email at the lighthouse lowdown at gmail.com. Check out our website, the lighthouse lowdown.com where you can. Leave a review if you really like this episode. We don't get a lot of reviews, but we know that it's that we're worth more than that. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. We're just having fun. I yeah. appreciate everybody coming along. Thanks for everyone on our YouTube. YouTube is growing. Booming. And we love to see it. So we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you next time on The Lighthouse. Lighthouse.